you ever notice that I don't review dongles? Um, I think that most of them suck actually uh, for their price compared to a full size desktop amplifier. I just don't find their specs or their sound quality to be that compelling. I don't find them to be really a good deal. I find a lot of them to be overpriced. There are a few outliers, uh, like the Apple dongle is actually a really good value for 10 bucks. Um, there's a couple ones sort of in the mid-fi level, and then there's ones that are on the upper end of dongle prices, but actually have really good performance like this Moondrop Moonriver 2. And this actually is the first device that I've really looked at a dongle like this and thought, man, I wonder if this is actually a potential future for hi-fi. So today we're gonna to be talking about the performance of this thing and the potential performance for dongles like this in the future. First, I wanna go over some really incredible specifications. Okay, so just listen to this really quick. This device, which has USB-C power, has a total harmonic distortion through its DAC and its amplifier of 0.00015%, a dynamic range of 131 dB, a signal to noise ratio of 116 dB, and all of that for $200 and the size of your finger. The crazy part about that is that all of those specs for $200, even compared against full-size desktop amplifiers, are really, really good. Now, this is not the only DAC amp with good measurements in these areas. Typically though, the compromise that you make is power. Uh, but the power of this thing is actually pretty sufficient. It's relatively low on wattage, but pretty high on voltage. This thing puts out four volts RMS, which is very high. And some internet people who are a little bit smarter than me with mathematics estimated that this has about 270 milliwatts into 32 ohms, which is not that much power compared to a full-size desktop amplifier, but compared to other dongles, it's actually quite a bit. For example, the Dragonfly Cobalt has about half that power, but it's really the voltage that allows this thing to play really well and be a pretty strong contender for even full size, full planar magnetic headphones, which is very impressive. And probably the one distinct feature through this whole thing that I was most impressed with was how much power this thing can actually output given the size and capability and specs and price of it. So inside, it looks like this is a dual op amp design. This also features dual CS43198 DAC chips. This is a Sirius Logic chip. I don't think I've ever heard this specific DAC before. Um, and since it's impossible to separate the DAC and the amplifier, I can't make any distinct uh, proclamations about how the DAC sounds or how the amplifier sounds. I have to judge this as a whole unit. So you might be saying to yourself, okay, well, uh, all right, it's got a little bit of power. What can it power? And uh, this is where it gets really impressive. So I powered HD8XXs, I powered Meze Elites, Arias, LCD5s, and Diana TCs off of this, which are all very either high impedance headphones or very big planar headphones. Only one of them I think really was a, a problem for it, and that was the Diana TC, which is an incredibly high impedance planar. Though that headphone is kind of a, a difficult test bench for something like this. It's kind of built to be that way. Um, it's incredibly high impedance for a planar and it's very low efficiency. So it just doesn't get driven well off of most things. You really need something with a ton of power. This is not able to provide quite that much power. Okay, that being said, short of that headphone, I was pretty shocked at how good the performance was on other planars. For example, this LCD5, which, uh, this thing has no business being able to power through laptop power off of a device like this, was able to drive this just astonishingly well. Like this sounds really great. The bass impact was substantial. The speed and tonality of the mid-range was great. The treble response and transients was awesome. Um, all those really fun audiophile terms that you would typically look for uh, when kind of reviewing a DAC amp uh, this thing had. Now granted, this thing's doing it a few favors where it's a pretty efficient headphone, so it's not super demanding for power. Um, but there's a very clear difference between the sound of this on a laptop output versus this like Moon River output. Now I think the reason that I have a slight problem with dongle reviews, typically the comparison that gets made is like, okay, uh, does this sound better than your phone? Or does this sound better than your laptop output? The reason why I think that's unfair is because you're adding additional cost, in this case, $200, but not comparing it against something that you don't already have. So I think the fair way to do it is say, okay, should you spend $200 on this or $200 on a different type of amplifier, like maybe a Magni and a Modi, or maybe a, you know another small DAC amp like this? 
I think those are the comparisons that have to be made because I think, does it sound better than a laptop or a phone? Yeah, like most things do. It's, it's an easy thing to say and it doesn't really provide much context to someone like you, especially if you haven't heard this before. So let's talk about the power really quick on different devices and then some comparators. Um, on laptop power, it's great. The 2022 MacBook Pros, this thing is fine. I also got the same amount of power out of my full-size Windows desktop, though I was experiencing power limitations from my phone when using this with my phone. So if you're gonna use this with a phone, you may not have the full power output capability of this, not because of this thing's fault, but because of your device's fault. A small quirk of this, because this is really powerful, when you're using IEMs, which this has a dead silent noise floor, it's really phenomenal. It's got this incredible dynamics for an IEM. The, the tonality and texture and speed of this thing is, is really good for IEMs. The one downside of this though with IEMs is that because it's so efficient that when you're dealing with something like a phone, the volume increases are like 10% of the time, which is huge. Even on a MacBook, you're dealing with these big increments of volume difference and on an efficient IEM, even on low gain on this thing, which you would get by double pressing the, the up and down volume buttons, you can really get these big jumps in volume and they can kind of suck sometimes. My preferred system to run this with is Windows because you can adjust the volume in increments of 2% at a time. So it's very, very easy to go up in volume or down in volume smoothly without these massive jumps in volume. And to show you how big of a problem this is, typically, on an IEM, an efficient IEM with this thing, I am under 20% of the low gain at all times. I'm somewhere in between 10 and 20. Now on the phone, that's the difference between a low volume and super loud volume. Uh, whereas on Windows, I can be like, okay, 14, 16, 18, and anywhere in between, right? So just be aware of that. So competitors, right? You could buy an Apple dongle and a Magni and you would get more power, but I don't think it would sound as clean as this. And uh, especially not when you involve something like IEMs. That also isn't going to be as mobile. You will have to use a wall wart uh, for the, the Magni, um, but it is doable. And I do think that system for approximately, I think 130 bucks when you consider taxes and shipping for everything is a pretty good value. I, recommend that. But this is for a slightly different use case. And I actually think that this sounds slightly cleaner, though, if you really have super, super demanding headphones, that's probably the system I would go for simply because of the power output of that magnet. Though I think that the vast majority of modern headphones, even high impedance headphones like HD 800s, you can run off this, like seriously run off this. And uh, you can apply EQ adjustments to the bass response, which normally low power amps have a big problem reproducing this has no problem with it. It's very impressive. Another comparison would be something like a Dragonfly Cobalt. Um, to be honest, I've heard a couple Dragonflies. I don't like the sound of them. I don't think they, they sound that impressive. And especially given the price difference where the Cobalt is, I think 330 bucks or something like that. This has cleaner specifications in almost every category and about double the power output of that. And this has a different USB style interface compared to that, and that may be a benefit or a drawback. I don't know, I'm not impressed with the Dragonfly stuff. I'm very impressed with this. Another honorable mention here is something called a Colorfly M1. Um, this is something that has close to similar specs to this, but I don't have it here. I haven't tested it. I don't know if it sounds good or if it holds up to the quality of this, but it is about half the price. It might be worth checking out. This leads me to a question that I just find personally fascinating, which is, is the future of hi-fi in nano products like this? Your initial reaction is gonna be like, probably not. Like there's no way that this is gonna compete against full-size desktop amplifiers. And I'm not sure, and hear me out here. So like USB-C is capable of pushing uh, 100 watts and I think 18 volts. Now 18 volts is way more than you need for headphones. 100 watts is way more than you need for headphones. But let's say you could get like 10% of that wattage to pass through this into a headphone. You could be dealing with a 10 watt amplifier with four volts like this has with incredibly clean specs and potentially as the technology gets easier to make and competition gets steeper, you could even be dealing with a product that's the same price tag. I mean, you're never gonna need another amplifier after that, right? You're gonna be dealing with total harmonic distortion numbers, signal and noise ratios, and you know dynamic range numbers that are beyond your comprehension. And then when you mix the power capability of that, you're gonna be dealing with an amplifier that has no faults 
And once we're there, it's gonna be pretty incredible. Um, I think that we'll start to see the same issues start to crop up where a lot of these are gonna start blending together in terms of performance. Right now, I think there's a separation between the good ones and the bad ones, but a lot of the good amplifiers these days are very hard to tell apart, uh, if at all, and I think that these will eventually get there too. So this makes me wanna ask you a question. Let's say that you could buy either a full-size desktop deck amplifier for $500, right? Just like a big desktop amplifier. Let's say a product this size had exactly the same spec capability. Uh, let's say same power output, same exact total harmonic distortion, same numbers in every capacity. Which one would you go for? Would you go for the small, like, you know, hideable, very cloaked device? Or would you go for the big kind of thing that feels like 500 bucks? I'm very curious what you'd want. All right, thank you very much for watching. Until the next video, my name is Josh, signing off. Peace.